former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage. Welcome back Good to morning. the programme. Do you agree with Mr Trump's decision to bar Syrian refugees indefinitely from entering the United States? I agree with the concept called democracy, a point that appears to be missed by almost all commentators, and especially, could I say, with the BBC. He was elected. He was elected to get tough. He was elected to say he would do everything within his power to protect America from infiltration by ISIS terrorists. Now, uh, you know, there are seven countries on that list. Um, he's entitled to do this. He was voted in yeah. on, you know, on this ticket. I, I didn't ask you if he was entitled. That's not my point of contention. I asked you if you agreed with it. Uh, well, I do, because I think that if you just look um, at what is happening in France and Germany, if you look at Mrs Merkel's policy mm. on this, which was to allow anybody in virtually from anywhere, mm. look what it's led to. But you said in 2013 there's a responsibility on all of us in the free mm. West to try and help some of those people fleeing Syria, literally in fear of their lives. Well, that's right. The Christian community in many of those countries has, has virtually now been... It's almost too late because most of them have now been wiped yeah. out. But I did make the point that if you're, if you're looking for a genuine definition of a refugee, all right, we go all the way back to 1951, it is somebody who is in direct fear of persecution all their life because of mm. their race religion But you or didn't beliefs. talk about only Christians. You and you and in January 2014 you then said I seem to recall that it was UKIP who started the debate on allowing Syrian refugees. Mm. You seem to be in favor of allowing well, proper uh, uh, refugees into this if, country if they can be defined. Uh, Mr uh, but now you support Mr Trump who won't let any in. Well Mr Trump is running American policy not British policy and again I think we need to distinguish between these two things. I mean frankly since I made those comments, we had the Merkel madness, all right? And, 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 and I think that Trump's policy in many ways has been shaped by what Mrs. Merkel did. He is fully entitled to do this. And as far as we're concerned in this country, yes, I would like to see extreme vetting. Since 9-11, and including 9-11, can you name any terrorist event in the United States that it's involved refugees who've been allowed into the country? No, in fact, the um, terrorist events that have happened in America have been US citizens who've been radicalised whilst in America. Not refugees? No. But when you've got a problem already, why on earth would you wish to add to it? And I would remind you that of the eight people that committed those atrocities in Paris, five of them had got into Europe posing as refugees. So, yes. so, so there is an issue here. There is, but perhaps not for America, because America has the most rigorous and lengthy refugee screening process in the world, especially for Syrians. You have to register with the UN yeah. Agency for Refugees. That agency then recommends certain names to America. They then have to go through biometric uh, screening, database screening, intelligence screenings, including four separate intelligence agencies screen you, each one not allowed to talk to the they, other. Only one, uh, can, if one comes out against you, you don't get in. Indeed, you're banned for life. How more rigorous would you want it to be? It's very much more rigorous than we are, right. or the rest of Europe is. So what's the need for a ban? This is why we have elections, Andrew. We have elections so that voters can make choices. And they voted for Donald Trump to become president. And he said he would put bans in place and then move towards extreme vetting. Now, as far as Syria is concerned, he's made that decision. But, but that's what he was voted in for. And I, and I really... Can't I understand, quite understand. But I'm asking how, you've, since you know him, you've met him, you're a confidant of his, I'm testing you on the logic of it. Not that he's democratically uh, elected. Yeah. I'm not asking you uh, about well, that. The logic I'm trying of it to is. get the, the case, particularly since if you take the seven countries of which the ban applies mm. for 90 days, again, of these seven countries, uh, its citizens have not been involved in terrorist attacks in the United States. And, of course, it would be a mistake to say that it's just Muslim countries because the biggest Muslim countries in the world, of course, have, have not been included in this. Uh, Look, the point is, the point is, they have made this assessment. They've bought themselves 90 days to think about the policy. It's, it, this is exactly what Trump's voters would have wanted him to do. You once said that the president's rhetoric on Muslims and immigration made... Even you feel, quote, very uncomfortable. Because he started off by saying there would be a total ban, as if it was forever, and he then amended it to say that there would be some vetting. Now, as far as Syria is concerned, my guess is that what he's going to do is to try and genuinely help Syrian people, and he will be talking about the creation of some safe zones. Let's see. But oh, he, he hasn't. But, but that he, was taken out of the executive well, order. Well, we will see. We will see. I suspect something like that is coming down the track. What advice did you give to the president and his advisers ahead of Theresa May's visit? 
that I wanted us to talk about trade and that I wanted uh, to give the Prime Minister the impression that actually, when she's been surrounded for a whole career by civil servants and politicians who say that everything takes five years or seven years or ten years to make it clear to the Prime Minister that actually, if there's will, these things can be done quickly. But isn't there a great danger for a British Prime Minister who has to deal with the President of the United States? Yeah. Uh, uh, Realpolitik, I understand uh, that. But to ally herself so closely with such an unpredictable, such a controversial President, banning Muslims uh, in certain ways and refugees, building a wall with Mexico, threatening trade wars so, so, so with I, other I, I, countries, I, thinking of ending sanctions against Russia. I, I'm really missing something here. What is controversial about, de about, about defending the Mexican border? I mean, Bill Clinton spoke in very tough terms about this. George Bush built 600 miles of fence, and because it's Trump, there's uproar. I, I, I find this extraordinary. So you think there's no risks for a British Prime Minister in being the best friend of this particular I think there is president? absolutely no risk in putting together a trade deal, and there is absolutely no risk in her being the bridge between America and the rest of NATO to say to NATO members, if you don't pay your 2%, he's serious. So, no, on those things, there's no risk at all. It was clear from her Lancaster House speech that the Brexiteers in the government had won pretty much every argument in, t in terms of the negotiations to come out. What do you want from her now that she hasn't given you on Brexit? Uh, delivery. Um, she was very good as Home Secretary. Do you remember those wonderful speeches? Tory party conferences, the Tory press saying this was the new Thatcher, and actually she failed completely and utterly. She even failed to control immigration from outside the European Union. So yes, it was a good speech, and it was, and it was for many of us, on the Eurosceptic side of the argument, I mean, I could scarcely believe... Well, she gave you everything, I could she? scarcely believe that a British Prime Minister was saying things for which I had been roundly abused and vilified. But I have a feeling we may be in for a very frustrating 2017. The mood, as I can see it in Brussels, is that negotiating with Britain is not a priority. They're far more worried about Dutch elections, French elections, German elections, and possibly even Italian elections. And I worry that by the end of this year, we may not have made very much progress. Now, that is why the Trump visit suddenly brings things into focus. What if, and you know, we've agreed to start these talks immediately, what if, by the middle of June, for argument's sake, the Americans say, OK, we've reached this position with the British, we've compromised all the tough stuff, food standards and things like that, we're ready to sign a deal now. And then May has to say, well, actually, Mr Juncker says, I can't sign this until we leave. Oh, you can't? Uh, well, you can. I mean, what could they do to us? They can't throw us out, we're leaving anyway. No, but, you, but everyone agrees, including the government, that you, you, you can talk about a deal, though there's some doubt about that, you can maybe even do a heads of agreement. But you cannot sign a treaty well, until we've left the EU. Well, let me predict that by the end of this year, we will find a European Union who frankly don't want to talk to us, and we'll find countries all around the world that want to get on and do things. And that is going to be, I think, the big tension for May over the course of this year. But if the Prime Minister is giving you everything you want on Brexit, I take the point about delivery, yeah. but at least you agree that she is trying to get, from your point of view, the right things. If she does deliver on that, if she gets Brexit on the terms of which you approve, what's the point of UKIP? Oh, you could argue that about any political party. Parties are formed, uh, and if we've achieved, you know, the goal that we set out to achieve, there are right now out there four million people who are absolute UKIP loyalists. They are delighted that by voting UKIP, we got a referendum. They'll be even happier if they see us leave the European Union. And I think there is still a huge gap in British politics for a party that says it as it sees it, is unafraid by political correctness, and is seen to be on the side of the little people. And that's well. why, that's why, with the Labour Party as fundamentally split, and it really is totally split, over this European question, I think UKIP's in good shape. Well, that proposition will be put to test at the Stoke it Central by-election. It's one of UKIP's best prospects in the country, however mm. you uh, cut it. Some people call it the, the capital of Brexit. Labour's in chaos over Article 50, as you've pointed out. It's picked a candidate to fight Stoke Central, who's described mm. Brexit as a pile of merde, I use the French <laughs> word. The Tories don't seem to be trying. They've got their eyes on Copeland. If your successor, Paul Nuttall, who is fighting this seat, if he can't win the Stoke by-election, there's not much hope for you, is there? Well, I think he will. I've always been told, never make predictions, but I like making predictions. I think Paul will win Stoke. And if he and doesn't? I, uh, if he doesn't, it'll be tough. If he doesn't, we'll still have our four million loyalists. If he does, 
then we can actually see that Labour are beatable in their heartlands, and I think UKIP will be off to the second very big stage of its history. Nigel Farage, thank you for being with us.